Thank you for coming. And now, Talia Zedek and Leela Corman, Multimedia Extravaganza. Sounds wash over me, beating me down like waves that hit too fast to resist. I'm under their weight. I don't want to rise to the surface. I want this particular oblivion. I'm 19. I'm 49. Dressed almost the same. Maybe my clothes fit better now. The same hair, maybe slightly better cut as well, feeling a nearly identical distant heartbreak. Though perhaps that's better cut this time too. Once again, standing in the crowd at a cum show alone. Like all else in life, everything is better cut now and cuts deeper. Come or the platonic ideal of a band. I said that to you once. Years later, you repeated it to me as if you'd thought of it yourself. I nurse a distant heartbreak in the dark. It could be any year. What happens in the space between audience and performer? It's a transmission of power. A gift not specifically designed for you, which you transform upon receipt into something only yours. And sometimes share, as if donating an organ. Here, I thought you might like this. I was 19. I raced home stinking of milk from my job at the punk ice cream parlor to hit record on the live performance come we're about to give on WMBR. I was a big live Skull fan, so I was excited to hear Talia Zedek's new band. The first call and response slides of Off to One Side wrapped around me. It made me weep. As if I understood this sophisticated music made by people older and wiser than me. I'm 19. I'm 49. At some point, we are all marked by loss. Why'd you stop talking to me? Did I say the wrong thing? I look so stupid in this skimpy suit. Who are you when you are in the ocean? Floating in this massive body that is indifferent to little bloody you. Yet somehow, you're still yourself in there with all your fleeting concerns, your short-term pain, your ephemeral attachments, thinking your mundane thoughts. Who am I when I'm in the audience, bathing in the oceanic sound? I've probably seen come more than nearly any other band, and somehow I'm always my little bloody self in there, thinking my tiny thoughts, never merged enough. I remember hearing certain songs for the first time, transfixed. I remember where I was standing in the room. The music felt like it was directly about my life, which I was too caught up in. I couldn't relax. Now, as an adult, with absences, exiles, and losses racked up, when I have the chance to see musicians perform, I drink it in like we all might disappear tomorrow. Someday we'll all be dead and no longer able to have this experience. I have finally caught up to this music. I once thought I'd lost that girl or maybe killed her. Now I know how to reach back in time and pull myself to the surface. It turned out she was standing in the crowd right where I'd left her.
In the obliterating ocean of noise, I hold her hand and warn her about the future. Just like you said, everything is happening. She's not listening to me. What does this album sound like? Like a sad lover's lullaby. Like goodbye and hello and the same kiss. The rhythm se section especially sounds like the heavy pulse at the bottom of a hard ocean wave smack down. Like the scrapes and bruises you find afterwards in places only you can see. You agreed to them though. That's what it sounds like. Like winter in New England in obvious ways. And also in its actual sound. The music is like a grand snowstorm that surrounds you in dark blue. It is its own weather. It stings like tears. Listening to it now, I can't believe it exists. It doesn't sound like anything else from the time it was made or any era, other era. I can hear things. That high up on the neck jackhammer guitar on Let's Get Lost feels right out of the Roland S. Howard playbook, but repurposed and fresh. The intense, raw vocals land like the most, most forceful love note you've ever received. Like they're ripped out wiring from an entire lifetime's experience. No one else sounds like that. I forgot about Come for a while. I forgot a lot of things. Sometimes you try to banish parts of yourself. Sometimes you think you are in exile. One day in 2016, I randomly shared off to one side with a friend and it all came back in. Check this song out. I'd forgotten how much I love this band. Uh, holy shit, holy shit, holy shit. Isn't it great? I can't talk, I'm just listening to it on repeat. What you try to bury will rise and claim her right to live. People will welcome her, you. All of your bodies will rise to the surface and find you again.
Where do I begin? Maybe in the forest. It's a specific forest, not a mythological one. It's in the hills above Gribov in deepest Galicia. My mother's father, Mendel Lipcher, is alert, listening for Gestapo while his group of friends and family hides nearby. It is approximately where I am standing today, November 3rd, 2019. From the freshly restored Jewish cemetery of Gribov, I look down into Papa's tiny town and at the soft hills surrounding it and breathe the air of the mountains he loved. The forest was his beloved hiking grounds and then a place of trauma as much as refuge for him and all who hid there with him. Its resemblance to the Catskills is impossible to miss. There are many beginnings to this story, but the only real one is the severing of Jews from Poland, of the living from the dead, of us from our homes, and it turns out of Poles from us, because as Pszemek, who met me at the airport, said to me on the drive to Novi Sanj, this is your culture too. You are not a guest. What did your grandparents tell you about Poland? The proper, only, way to make borscht? The correct kind of pierogi? This is a trick question. What did you absorb in their silences? That it was a place inaccessible to you? A place of betrayal? The graveyard of our culture? I've come to Poland for the dedication of a memorial in the cemetery. But before the ceremony, we are brought to a place I did not know existed, that no one in my family had ever mentioned to me. The mass grave of Białonizna, which is thought to hold 360 people, including my grandfather's parents and some of his siblings. It's said that a local farmer held at gunpoint in his cellar during this action, made a mark for every shot he heard that day in August 1942. Now there's no sound but wind and dogs at the mass grave of Białonizna. As soon as I arrived in Poland, I felt the multi-generational trauma. I felt it in my gut, in my soul. I felt it in the airport parking lot. It immediately became clear that my counterparts there feel it too. They fight the silence they were raised in about the past and feel a deep sense of loss at our absence. My friend Kamil always wondered why there was a tree growing out of the roof of the ruined synagogue. Now he painstakingly researches the Jewish history of the town and the region. My mother wants to know what kind of pierogi your grandmother made. Oh, potato and onion. Ah, pierogi ruski. Anna and Ivona take me on a tour of the town and the hills that Papa loved so much. I can still hear the way he said mountains in his heavy Galicianer accent, like a Yiddish Bela Lugosi, mountains. When I return, there's a platter of pierogi large enough for a small army waiting for me, though it quickly becomes clear that I am supposed to eat them all. I'm sorry, Danuta, they were amazing. I'm only one woman. Danuta showed me so much kindness and welcome with that question. It's the grandmother's language of food made by their own hands, because of course my grandmother's pierogi were the best, and so were yours. For much of this trip, I couldn't stop listening to Thurston Moore's new instrumental, Alice Moki Jane. Its fractal beauty floated me high above history. I thought before coming here that I would feel so dark, 
But instead, something happened that I did not expect at all. I recognized myself in this place. I have never said before that I am Polish, but these mountains, this food, the love and gravity I sense from the people I'm with here tell me that I am. Chronologically, the story began when a student of mine told me she knows a guy in her shul in West Palm Beach who was in Auschwitz from this little Polish town called Grybów. Cue me falling out of my chair. That guy turns out to be Leon Shagrin, who turns out to have grown up next door to my grandfather's family and was in the lager with one of my great uncles. He also tells me he was my beloved Primo Levi's bunkmate there in Buna Manowitz, the subcamp of Auschwitz where they were enslaved. He was a soft boy, quiet. We kept asking him, are you sure you're Jewish? You don't speak Yiddish. Before I left his apartment, he stopped me and said, let me tell you something. Your grandfather and his brothers were called the flower of the town. They were modern, they were clean shaven, they rode bicycles. And if anyone heard a Jew, if a Jew was attacked and beaten up, they would come with revenge. We called them the flower of the town. The flower of the town. And your grandfather was like a soldier under orders from only himself. So a year later, here I am in Poland to take part in the unveiling of the memorial of the Jewish dead in Grybów that my friends there have commissioned. There are 1,700 names in all, a huge number for such a tiny town. My great-grandparents and many other relatives of mine are there. My body is a mass grave containing all the dead I never knew, whose names are on that black stone in the cemetery. But my body is lying beneath a feather quilt exactly like my grandmother's in Kamil's parents' house. Welcome home. You belong here. It's nice to see you again, Leela. Give my regards to your mother. These events took place right after All Saints Day. There's a tradition in Poland visiting the graves of loved ones at that time and leaving colored glass lanterns in the cemeteries. Kamil tells me this is called grobbing, which means graving. I love this. We Jewish descendants of Grybów stand with hundreds of Poles as Jewish and Catholic prayers are spoken, speeches are given, and musicians play. School children stand at attention. And then it's over and we return to the world of the living down the mountain. Well, that was nice. My great-granddaughter looks like a goy. So she's modern, no? In the world of the living, I find that I have fallen in love with Poland, with Papa's mountains, with beautiful Krakow, a city of cafes and bookshops and layers of history. My history, too, that calls me back. And with the work of the people I met there, which is, in my eyes, profoundly anti-fascist. It is work for the future, not only for memory. On my last night in Krakow, I dreamed I was at a lecture on a college campus in the US when a group of huge neo-Nazis materialized and began beating the crap out of everyone. More kept appearing. A few nights after I returned, a Jewish colleague told me over dinner, Jews need to stop talking about the Holocaust. It's so boring. My feet remembered the sensation of my great-grandparents' bones beneath them. My eyes went to my boots, still dusted with dirt from their mass grave. My colleague's mouth continued to move. I floated above her history, along the river of my own blood, back to Poland, to where my living memories are safe.
Um, so, uh, is this on? Yeah, this is on, right? Check, check, check. Okay, there we go. So, uh, welcome everybody to the Q&A uh, part of this um, collaboration between Talia and Leela. I've been saying Thalia for 20 years. <laughs> <laughs> First question. I did, I train, I've been training. <laughs> uh, first question, uh, Talia, um, how's it feel to be involved with SPX as a non-cartoonist? <laughs> it's, it's, been, uh, it's been great. I mean, I, I love cartoons. It's, I've never had really heard of this stuff. It's definitely not my world, but so it's finding out more and more, like, friends are like, oh, man, you're really, you know, at SPX is like, is a, a really big deal, um, and uh, yeah, um, my partners have, have added reader of stuff, so I've gone, you know, I was like getting gifts for her, like, you know, trying to trying to keep up with her voracious appetite, which I finally gave up on. It's, <laughs> it's an expensive habit of, like, <laughs> I know, it's like, but, um, but yeah, this has been amazing. It's been, I can't believe there's so much beautiful art here, yeah. I, so tell me about the points at where you two formed a friendship and how far do you, tonight's a collaboration between you two, how far do you see this collaboration going? Uh, uh, we, I think we really met when I hosted you guys at SAW a couple yeah. of years ago. Yeah, but I mean we were, you know, I think you could probably speak to this even more than I can, but I think the, the kind of Boston and New England art and music world is kind of small. You know, at least like our generation. Yeah. Eventually you end up meeting everybody. Yeah. So like I used to go see your band when you were, when I was in art school and like you were, you were in come, so you were like, you were playing all the time. But we didn't meet for a long time after that. So, yeah. Um, I haven't thought about the second part of the question. <laughs> I'll let you take yeah, all we, of that. We really got a, um, I, I met Leela when she hosted, I was doing, um, me and Chris Brokaw, who's the other guitar player in Come, were doing a living room tour. Um, it was back in, was that 2019, I think? 2018. 18. Yeah, end of 2018. Wow. And um, so Leela hosted us in Gainesville, and I hadn't played in Gainesville in ages. I was, I was kind of like the town. For some reason, hmm. it's kind of so, weirdly magical. We showed up on was it Tom Petty's birthday? Like yes. <laughs> Which of course, be wow. like me being a total yeah, classic rock dummy, like I had no idea, you know. And everybody in Gainesville worships him. Oh, I didn't I know. Love Tom you know. Petty too, so I was totally <laughs> cool with it. But anyway, um, she hosted us. At, it was a your, it was like an artist. What was it? It was at Sequential Art. Arts Workshop, which is, which is the school that Tom over there in the audience runs in the warehouse that we had just moved into. I, I didn't really know what to expect, but I, I loved Leela immediately. Aw, I loved <laughs> you immediately and then, too. And then, and then we have a, down that we have, we have a, a ton of mutual friends, but, um, yeah. but I, I wasn't really in, in the art school crowd. Plus I'm older than you, so probably like maybe a gener different generation. Like a half, a half bit. generation maybe. Yeah, like you that. live next door to my uh, tattooist. <laughs> no, yeah, no, 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 we do a ton of people, so then we kind of just kept in touch with social media and when, um, when we moved back up north um, during the pandemic and stuff, I was, I was excited and wanted to get together with her. And we did talk about collaborating completely separate from this, and I, we couldn't figure out, I was like, we should do something together sometime, because, I don't know, we just have a lot of the same, I don't know what it is. I don't know, we don't have, I just feel like we know, you know, we have a lot of the same stuff in a way. And, um, and we, yeah, we then, yeah, that'd be cool. And then, then I asked you to do the poster art for the Live Skull TZ Band Tour. You made a, like a wonderful, wonderful poster for that. And yeah, that was really fun to do. And then I don't know how the band camp piece came about. How did that um, that came about because that was the first piece that we showed. Yeah, that that piece about come. So that's for a column on Bandcamp called Resonance that is usually prose. Although I think they've run some comics in the past. 
about personal relationships with music and usually focused on one album. Uh, I think it came about because I had, I was following the one of the Bandcamp editors on Twitter and she posted about it as a new column and I immediately wrote her and was like, hey, do you, would you ever take a comics pitch? And then I was kind of, I'm trying to remember when, like if, if I'd immediately thought about come as a subject for that or if that came later, but immediately as soon as I thought of it, it clicked. Like, so I don't remember when because it immediately seemed like such an obviously good idea, you know? Uh, and it was really easy. I, I pitched Mariana Timoney at Bandcamp and she was like, oh yeah, this is great, let's do it. That's how it came about. <laughs> I was really blown away about it. So my old Thank band, you. which isn't really been active in, in like 30 years, but we're getting all, all of our stuff is being reissued now. It all had gone out of print, and uh, there's a, a London label called Fire Records that's reissuing it all. And so they had just reissued um, our second album, Don't Ask, Don't Tell, and, and so Bandcamp. I'm, I'm assuming that most people know what that is, but maybe you don't, if you don't. But yeah, so they were doing a did a, a big review of it, and the review was basically... It was they, so they, I think I must have pitched it in conjunction, like, like I might have said, because this is about to be reissued, uh, maybe this is like the right time to run this. Or maybe that was their decision. It's weird that I don't remember the exact specifics of that, but, but yeah, I mean, that was kind of perfect timing. Yeah. I, might, I might have pitched it before I knew about that reissue too, which I'm so glad all those albums are being reissued. And then Linda from SPX saw that and brought up the idea of us maybe collabor doing some kind of collaboration. Yeah. With, with this, so. And then we just kind of like played around in your living room in, in yeah. Alston until I figured out basically what I should do. Like you were, you were already like, you were already playing really beautiful stuff. I was like, I don't know, should I draw on these pieces of acetate? Well, my hand burns in this overhead projector. Maybe not. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Our original idea was to like both improvise. So like I improvise music while she was like improvising, making a drawing, but it, it didn't really work out. No, I think yeah. I have yeah. enough work that works better as a reading anyway. Yeah, so you we know. Can, like, revise things, um, stuff. Yeah, I like the way this is kind of like um, reminiscent of like early. Like in the early films, they'd have like a live accompaniment by like, like an organist, and I like. <laughs> I love that. That's great. And I like the way that this uh, performance forced you to. Where well, there's times when I couldn't hear you, but then that made me focus more on the drawing. So you end up like reading, like being involved in reading instead of having somebody read to you. So um, it kind of reintroduces to you what comics are about. You're still reading. I'm feeling like you know your presence, but I'm actually. <laughs> no. <laughs> that was a beautiful performance. What, so I don't see you as a big email person. And like your friendship has like really like, you know, guys have cl gotten closer, cl collaborated more and more in the last few years. Has, how, what is this, um, has this been like more of an analog, like old fashioned friendship where you two talk in person more? Or does a lot of it happen uh, electronically as well? I mean, social media is sort of everybody's default these days, right? Like, yeah. especially in the pandemic and people being really busy. We have not seen each other very much. I, I think I saw you once during, since before we started doing this. Like, no, like, well, a couple times, yeah. Times, yeah. Yeah, there was that like really, like middle of the pandemic before vaccines outdoor lunch. Yes, I remember. That, that was really fun. But also I was terrified that I was gonna like catch COVID on the train and pass it on to you. And then I was like, I was sitting on the train having kind of a like guilt-ridden anxiety attack in advance. <laughs> oh no, I'm gonna infect my friend. Um, I wanna go back to what you said about um, coming from kind of a similar place. Um, so sorry, I don't wanna derail you from that question that you just asked, but yeah. I, 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 that's something that's always interested me about your work and mine too. Like I, I definitely feel like we're drawing from kind of a similar pool. I have like a serious question for you too. So I wrote this down, so I'm gonna read. Um, That's how we know it's serious. So both of you, there always seems to be a uh, more road left for you but in, your in your chosen mediums, and that hasn't changed. Your, your chosen mediums, you as a singer, songwriter, you as a cartoonist, and your work has changed. I was talking with Tom earlier about how you, um, 
your work changed when you started to embrace color and painting more in your comics. And you've gone from this like post-birthday party influenced, uh, no wave artist to um, you know the form that your music is now. Uh, what do you say to that about being people who've stayed focused on your chosen medium? Like they're all like I've said before, there always seems to be more slack in the rope as you as you continue on this journey. Whereas other people get burnout and they stop, or they they continue to do music, but they stop doing albums. Like you both have been very consistent in terms of how your work is presented, and about staying committed to the work. You want to take this one? <laughs> you go first. So it's definitely, you know, I'm not the most well-rounded person, I have to say, so you're, you're right. I've been just doing this for like a really long time and it's, you know, and I, I kind of like took some time off from it for a little while and I was really unhappy. I just like it physically makes me feel good to play music. So I, I just start feeling like crappy physically even like, and it's, um, I, don't, I don't know why that is. I think, I, you know, ever since I was a kid, I've always, been really into music, and I, I'm really um, also not really good at anything else, unfortunately. I mean, I wish I was one of those people that could, that could draw and, and, you know, a great artist and a great musician, and a lot of times that does go hand in hand, but in my case it doesn't. But, <laughs> so, my, my, actually, I, have, I do have art, visual artists in my family, and that gene seems to have skipped over me, so um, I can't draw, make anything look even borderline recognizable. Um, so yeah, so I, I kind of maybe because my brother was always a good artist, but whatever. I just, I just, when you have someone in your, other people in your family that are really good at something and you're not, then you're kind of like, okay, you know, I never, never pursued it. I, I took, I had a friend that was like, I can teach you how to draw. Well, yeah, anybody can draw. Yeah. And then she's like, I, I take, I'm teaching this class, you know, you know, DIY class at gallery. Come down and, and be in the class and. And she was like, I've never, she's so sweet, I've never seen her so angry before. She's like, she's like look at it. Like, oh, no, oh, no, no. Oh. Look at it, I was like, I'm looking at it. So, yeah, anyway. So, yeah, music has just been, kind of been my thing, you know. And I think I, maybe, st I started out actually writing poetry, um, which I definitely do not do anymore. But so, the, I think my first, when I was really young, it was, it was, um, Poetry, and then I think when I started writing songs, I, I completely. I used to try to put my poetry to music, and then for me, the two things did not work together. And yeah, then I just stopped. So I never write poems anymore. But, but well, you write lyrics, which fan. you know, direct relationship there. Um, I guess uh, I'm going to use your word. I, I've always been monomaniacal, not so much about comics, but about being an artist. Uh, that's a thing that I think I, it has remained consistent in my life and the times that I've tried to stray from that in, for various reasons have not worked out. Like trying to, uh, there was a brief period when I was in school where I quit and I went back and then I quit again and I thought, okay, I gotta go to school for something else because this art school thing's not working out. Mm -hmm. I can't find a, like, a path forward here and I can't figure out how to actually have a life like this uh, and that's just, I mean, it's like a boomerang, just, you know, uh, that's the wrong metaphor, but just, just, I get yanked right back to it. So, um, comics has always been a little bit of a strange place for me because I, I sort of never intended to be a cartoonist. I thought I was gonna be a painter, which is why when I started using watercolor in my comics, something really clicked and like, it was like the, the portal to the other side opened. Like, now, now I can, now I can touch the world of, of the dead. Like, now, now I can bring them here. That's, that's what happened when I started using watercolor. Um, and now when I just use straightforward black ink, it actually almost physically hurts. Like, there's not enough there. Like, it's, it's like banging into a, into a wall. Like, I can't, I can't get through to the, the source that I need to be able to have access to. It sounds really dramatic, but. Do you feel like there was pressure to make it all happen in black and white? No. No. When I started doing comics in watercolor, I started doing the kind of work that um, people couldn't put pressure on me about, I guess. I mean, before that. Oh. When you first start, when you find no. 
finding your way. No, I loved black and white, and I love ink. I, I just, I like spilling it. I like making giant marks with it. I love making tiny little precise, obsessive, fussy marks with it. I love black ink. It's just the, the act of working with color brings something else into it. It's a whole other set of elements. But I've, I've kind of, like you, Talia, I've never really been that good at anything else. Um, I mean, I've done a lot of other things, but I sort of, nothing really sticks. Like, I was a professional belly dancer for a decade. <laughs> you know, like, I was actually really good at that, but it wasn't sustainable and not a thing I wanted to keep doing. And then when I quit, it was really nice. Like, I was done with that, too. Mm -hmm. the, the making kind of um, slightly macabre, intense, figurative art has been the place that I have come back to again and again, working with the human body in some way. Uh, yeah, Tom was telling me that he thought that the direction your work is going in now with dealing with historical trauma c culminated with you rediscovering color. Uh, I guess, kind of. I mean, I've always... So, I thought I was going to be a painter um, from a very, very young age, and I was a really good painter, um, especially in watercolor, but in oil, too. And then I got knocked off my trajectory... Um, I won't, I won't really dwell on the reason why, uh, and ended up taking what felt sort of like a diminished path mm. to me of being a commercial artist, which like there's no problem, no, nothing wrong with doing that, but it wasn't what I really wanted to be doing. And I was always working with color. I love color. It's more that um, the ability to, to tell stories at the depth that I knew I was capable of but hadn't been able to get to yet happened when I started using watercolor. I also really hate coloring my comics digitally. It just makes me crazy. It feels like, uh, on, the, on the zine panel today, Jenny Zervakis said that working digitally made her feel like she was at work, and working by hand was a real pleasure for her. That really resonated with me. So I mean, trying to color my comics digitally the way I would color my illustrations just felt like drudgery, whereas working with watercolor felt like a process and experience, um, a ritual. So another way I would, I would uh, express this, going back to my notes, is um, I wrote down that there's a sonic texture to, well, there's a texture to both of your works. There's something, there's a term in um, your last comic you read, fractal beauty, and I think it describes a quality that's in your work and in your work. And in your, Tali, on your work, there's sort of a sense of the, um, what do I say, a sonic texture to your guitar. It's very, very specific and it expresses a kind of psychological state that's very consistent in your work. Atalia Zadek song has a, uh, has a vibe. And um, I, I want to uh, ask you too how your um, tool kind of helps lead the work that you create. Huh. Well, um, yeah, definitely, I definitely write all my songs on, on guitar and usually just kind of like noodling around, you know, and kind of like seeing where the guitar kind of leads me. So I, I just kind of, I just kind of follow that. Um, uh, so I'd say, yeah, it's, it's a big, a big part of my, my process. You know, I, I just, I just literally noodle. <laughs> I don't know, I just sit down and play my guitar. And like, I don't know what I'm playing. I'm not like practicing a song or anything like that. And I'll just, just mess around. Mess around until I find something I like, you know. And sometimes I do, and sometimes I don't. But um, yeah, that's so. I guess it does leads me in, in that way. It is the beginning of, of everything. Uh, I think that the, in some ways, the story uh, is in the materials, uh -huh, yeah. and and the materials unlock the, the work. Um, I'm not sure that 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 is the total explanation of how the work comes about, but um, the material quality of, of the medium that I'm using definitely influences the story that's being told and, and vice versa. I think it's, it's also, for me, more what I use it for. So I use color as a secondary um, nonverbal storytelling uh, element. And I learned, really, I learned about that from Pedro Almodovar films because he uses color in, in a way that uh, frames the story, but also um, 
pushes the story along in all of these nonverbal narrative ways that are really interesting. Uh, he uses a lot of nonverbal storytelling technique, not only color, but that, that's one that is immediately striking. Um, I've just also, like, how do I explain this? Delicatessen, is that him? No. <laughs> no, it's okay, that, that's a great movie. Yeah, yeah. But actually, the, um, I don't know if it was the director or the production designer of Delicatessen who is also a cartoonist. It's one of the like, very creepy, somebody in this audience knows the answer to this. It's been a really long time since I thought of it. Jason Little. Mark Carell. Thank you. <laughs> He's in Raw. He's like one of those kind of creepy French cartoonists in Raw in volume two. Um, no, Almodovar did Women on the Verge of a Nervous Breakdown, Talk to Her, uh, Julieta, like I, I could go on all night. Okay. Absolute master. Um, you know, he's only one. Uh, people talk about light and, and <sighs> narrative, but for me it's color, it's Almodovar. And I'm not really answering your question about materials. <laughs> um, I, I find that just working physically is really important. So whatever the material is, like the, the, the physical act of drawing and using my body to, to make the work uh, is just really important to how the story comes out, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. I mean, I've had, we're both cartoonists, and I've had crises, crisis, plural of, plural of crisis, what, uh, before trying to imitate other people. I mean, there's a way that you can kind of walk somebody else's walk but stay yourself. But I've had lots of points between having imposter syndrome and taking in too many influences where I um, you know, created work that when I go back, I look at it and I, it hits a false note for me. Have you ever had, you ever struggled with that? Um, I think I'm too much of a weirdo. Mm -hmm. and, and because I really only know how to draw people, maybe, maybe I'm just not, capable of copying other people, but I will say in the writing, I find that other, other people's influences come out. I wouldn't call it a struggle though. Like, sometimes it's a direct homage. There's a lot of Hernandez Brothers homages mm -hmm. in my work. Um, in the book I'm working on now and in Untersachen, there's a ton of both Gilbert and Jaime kind of calls that are really specific. Um, I don't know how to copy other people, except when I'm really when I really mean it, I copied an entire Otto Dix painting in my new book yeah. from a postcard with a number two round. <laughs> and it was really fun. Um, so no, I don't struggle with it. I actually, if I choose to do it, I do it out of enjoyment. And it's, it's really interesting. You really get inside of somebody else's work of art. Uh, but I've also never been a comics reader in the way that I know a lot of other people are. Like, I, I mean, I love the medium, but I've never, I've been, always been really picky about what comics I end up reading, and I, I haven't tried to copy the stuff that I like visually. I say that now, uh, look for my Dan DiCarlo ripoff in about two years. Okay, looking forward to it. <laughs> Talia, what about you? Same question. Um, I think, you know, um, I do, I, I do try to, I do make, make a conscious effort to um, not rip people off. <laughs> it, like in music, it's a little bit more, it's a little different maybe. You know what I mean? Like, so if you write a song and I'll be like, does this sound like too much like this song? Uh -huh. And then sometimes it'll sound like it to me and then I'll play it for people and they're like, no, I, I don't hear it at all. I'm the only one that hears it, but yeah, if I, if I come up with something and then I find out that actually someone else already came up with it, I'll, I'll toss it. I mean, it happens, you know. Um, we're all like subconsciously influenced, you know. We're like with music, you know, so, um, yeah, so I try, I try not to do that, but, um, but I don't know, so there's that aspect, but I enjoy covering songs. Yeah, just, yeah. Like, you know, and so, and so that's a, a great pleasure, and um, I've, you know, I've done a lot of, a lot of, covered a lot of different artists, and, um, and, and uh, that's kind of like, you know, a normal thing to do in, in music, you know what I mean, natural. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't expect to hear that it was gonna cre be a crisis for you. I mean, she's, <laughs> she's like Johnny Cash. But, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. You are, it's, I get a sense that you, you've always had a very strong grounded sense of who you are in your music. And that's not to say that, it's not to say that you haven't, it's just that no. we're so much alike, I thought maybe you'd struggled with it. 
No, but I'm really curious, Talia, what songs do you feel like you've accidentally quoted? God, I can't, I can't remember because I usually like, I usually like toss them right away. Yeah. Like I, if I'm there and I'll just be like, yeah, no, this sounds too much like, I, it doesn't happen a lot. Like what happens a lot is that I think it, it sounds like that and then I'll ask one of my bandmates, I'll, I'll play it for them. I'll just like, does this remind you of anything? When you were first guided to be on stage, was there somebody that were, was there a hero that you were emulating? Where you're like, I want to be this person. I was definitely, you know, a, I, I'd say Patti Smith was my biggest influence for sure. You know, um, you know, and punk rock. I kind of started getting serious about music like in the mid '70s, and um, and she was just starting and. You know, before I'd never heard anyone, another woman like her, someone who had a voice I could kind of relate to, and um, yeah, so that was that was huge for me. Um, so another question. So you've already answered that you are not exactly an insider with comics. You you love somebody who's really a big fan, and yeah. then you. So I've seen you play before where you have a huge. Peter Baggy hate logo on your guitar. Yeah. Yes. I have been wondering about the hate sticker on your cum guitar yeah. since 1992. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, you know, I don't think, I used to work at Newbury Comics. So I used to read, I used to read comics, you know, but I, I don't think I, when I got, I think I just liked the sticker and I was working, I was working at a t-shirt printing place and they printed t-shirts, rock t-shirts and stickers and stuff and I, I did know who the comic was from working yeah. I knew you know it, and I knew that it was really cool and then I saw the sticker and I it just I was like this is awesome I want to put a hate sticker on my guitar <laughs> yeah so and how have you managed to keep it so pristine all these years I don't know I don't know <laughs> but um yeah it was it was just like an impulse impulsive thing I love that that's great just like my Fuck Nazis sticker. That's quite an, quite an impulse, yeah, you know. Just one day you were like, fuck those guys. I never thought of it before, but like, fuck Actually, those guys. I, I, I saw these, these, I was on tour in Europe and I was actually, I think it was playing in Bratislava. And I was seeing these everywhere because it was, um, you know, during the Trump years and I don't know, just, you know, I can't remember what bad shit was happening. But, you Who know, can keep that shit straight? Yeah, it's like it's hard. nonstop. At the time, it was it was uh, probably like you know after, it was definitely like you know in the last like five years or something. So I was asking the promoter, I was like, I want one of those stickers. Where do I? How, where are these stickers coming from? And he just like ripped it off the bar and gave it to me. Like, oh wow! <laughs> I I found a T-shirt with that on it. Uh, maybe around that same time from a German anti-fascist uh, T-shirt and sticker company. Uh, and I would occasionally wear it to the gym in Florida, just, just in case, you know. Stay away from me. Don't tell me how to do deadlifts. <laughs> so, um, is there, you know, I'm honored to be here on stage with both of you. And Talia, you know, you're somebody who, um, uh, there's a, okay, but what's the word? Um, I don't want to get tongue tied, but you know, you're a big, inf you're a big inspiration to me. The honesty that you've put into your work, how much personal biography there is in your work, and even though I'm a cartoonist, I've strived on a certain level to impart my work with the same, uh, the same sort of sense of self. And um, is there anybody from another medium that you've has influenced you in a similar way? We can narrow it. Maybe we'll say visual arts, since we're talking about right. Leo as a cartoonist who's been helped. You've been shaped in a lot of ways by Talia, a musical artist. But your work could be very visual. You know, the image, image, imagistic, I guess. Yeah. Um, I'm really, I'm not sure how to answer that. Um, 
Originally, I was going to ask if there was a cartoonist that shaped you in a way that was. I'm sorry. Yeah. yeah. Well, then you can just talk about how you can talk about what comics you do of. I'd like to hear that. I was really into Batman. <laughs> well, when I worked at Newberry Comics, um, there wasn't. A, this was a long time ago. And there wasn't a ton of graphic novels then. There was like some of them, and I would. Um, I would got really into these, the really, really, really old ones. And we, we had like, like just tons and tons of them. Part of my job was to sit in the back and like uh, seal up the comics with like a, what did we used to do with them? Like a soldering thing, you know, to get the Seal the bags? Tubes. Yeah, seal the bags, oh. bag of the comics. And um, so, yeah, I, I was into that. And, you know, I, I read a, a lot of them then, but really, I don't. Hmm. I'm really not not super familiar with stuff. I what about know. literature? Oh, thanks. What about literature? Do you feel like that has an influence on your work? Um, yeah, I think I was definitely been influenced by some 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 people. Um, really influenced by. Um, this writer, Annika Van, who I like a lot. Um, mm -hmm. and, She's great. Um, yeah, and uh, I really, I really like the work, I guess with the visual arts, I, is I was very into um, sort of, the sur I guess, would it be surrealism? What's the movement in Zurich? Um, the, uh, it's not surrealism. Dada. Oh. Yeah, Zurich, Dada. There were there were yeah. different cities. Dada yeah. and Zurich was a really prominent one. Yeah, yeah, and, and um, a lot of the stuff that came out of there. And um, I found this book. I used to look to find books about that. I found this one book called Zero, and that was a, another sort of movement around. I think at that time. Um, so I, I guess it was you know like the sort of like the, the European stuff that was happening in like the the 30s and, and 40s. And mm -hmm. it's, it's yeah. And, it's interesting, I, and a lot of cool stuff was happening in Switzerland for, for some, some reason, I don't know. It's funny, I think that's another area of commonality for us because that, uh -huh. those art movements are a really big uh, influence on me as well. Um, the Dadaist and the Bauhaus and especially the Neue Sachtigkeit, uh, but all of, all of them sort of together. You know, I don't think they thought of themselves necessarily as these separate, pristine, nameable movements. Yeah. Um, we call them that now, but but yeah, yeah, that's it's important to me too. And your your work is specifically going back into um, you know history, history of your family, history of what happened to European Jews, and um, that's a direction that you're strongly going in. And Talia, your work, it's like from the instrumentation, the kind of the tool, you know, the instruments you use, um, from the songs you've done, like 1926 which like feel very emblematic of like uh, uh, what Berlin, like 1920s. I didn't write that song. Oh, you didn't? No, that's a cover. Oh. It's a cover, but it's a cover of a, of a completely unknown Boston band. Oh, wow. I knew them, but, um, yeah. but so I always like to give credit for that. It was a band called V. And um, the only, I guess the lead singer, Susan Anway, who recently passed away was the, actually the lead singer on the first two Magnetic Fields albums. Oh wow! The, They're was, amazing too. Like yeah, she's, she's amazing, amazing on that singer, album. But, um, but she didn't write that song. It was written by by Gary Gogol, and um, I, I had had his blessing to, to perform it. But yeah, I just always loved that song. Their version, the original version, sounds really different from the way I do it. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like a fast, strummy, not super fast, but like strummy, kind of like more up tempo thing. I kind of <laughs> drama did up. Your your version of it kills me. Like I can't listen to it without crying. I love it. I like to cry to music. <laughs> <laughs> I think I just really felt that like especially I think I you know as a gay person, you know, that it, that line lyric just really spoke to me. The, 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 the lyric is your god hates me. Mm. Um that's an amazing That's lyric, and the repetition of it also, yeah. and in, in your version of it, the intensity of that repetition, yeah. the building intensity of it, is like a gut punch. But it also, and the other thing, well, it's called 1926, and that was the year my parents were both born, so then 
that that always got me too. Yeah. So yeah. But it, it's just a cool song. I always liked it. It's the vi there's like violas or like the sound of violas in your music too. All these things viola, are. Yeah, yeah. He, I, I, there was a viola, <laughs> actual viola, but yeah. Um, he's not playing with me anymore. But Dave Dave Curry played played with me for like a long time until the last record. The songs you played tonight were those from uh, solo solo albums or were those from come albums? Uh, the first two were come songs. Um, they were actually both from Gently Down the Stream, which was our last record, and then and then the other ones were from my solo work. Yeah. Um, when you started playing, not as come, but as Talia or Zatalia Zadik band, yeah. um, was there is there a big like separation between the work? Is that work that Chris broke out, didn't contribute as much to? Or were you still, were, do you, when you look back at Cum, was that still mostly a vehicle for your lyrics? Um, well, Cum, Cum was, was, you know, we were, wrote together. I wrote all the, I wrote the lyrics that I sang on towards, towards the end of our, our run. Chris was, was singing a bit too, and mm -hmm. he wrote all, all his lyrics. Yeah, but we wrote the music together mostly. Music together? Yeah, yeah, but for this band I, that I've been doing for a while now, I've been in the last 20 years just writing by myself. Mm -hmm. I have another band too called E, yeah. which is <laughs> kind of a crazy and like a little more like sort of post-punk, like no wave with um, uh, Jason Sanford from Neptune and, um, and Gavin McCarthy from Karate and uh, we put out a, a few records, and, and we write together, collaborating. So I, I do, I get, I do get. I like both things. I like really like collaborating. I feel like it's necessary for me. I get really bored with myself. <laughs> you know what I mean? And the one thing you ask, like, how do you keep doing the same? You know, you've been yeah. doing it for so long, and I think collaboration is is really kind of breathes new life into into things. And so that's why I was super happy when we were asked to do this. I was asked to do this with. Lila, you know, I, I love her and I love her work and I was also like, it was, it was definitely a real challenge. I, I've never done this before. How does an artist, a visual artist and a musician collaborate together, you know, and um, so yeah. And you see, it can be pretty easy. Like, <laughs> yeah. it's, it can be a really straightforward process. I mean, it can also be really involved and, and uh, technical, but it can, I, you know, we're cartoonists, so we're sort of like, <laughs> not that technical. <laughs> Maybe that's just me. Uh, I was thinking about I was seeing Negative Land a few months ago. We talked about that when we were working on this, and like yeah. that level of of um, immersive visuals is something I'm not capable of. I'm just not trained in. But it doesn't have to be like that. Like it just can be. You know, you can work a lot of magic with just pictures and sound. And uh, I I think you're all the audience. The, you you went with us, right? Yeah, yeah. Something my dance teacher told me um, when, when I was training to be a professional performer is the audience always wants to meet you in the middle. I think that's true of readers too, by the way, in comics, but, and listeners in music. I, that, I always found that really helpful. Do we have any questions? Uh, anybody from the audience would like to ask? Yeah. Um, would you go up to the mic so they can record you? Can you go to the lectern? We don't have any mic. Oh, I'm using the mic. Go, go into the lectern for me would be too extreme. I, I jumped in there because I was actually thinking a lot about what the last topic you were just talking about, meeting, you know, being in the audience and meeting halfway. And I was enjoying how it was like very separate. The, the screens are really far away. You can't look at Talia and the screen at the same time today. And I, so my eyes had to keep going back and forth, which I liked. Um, and, but of course, my mind was doing both things. I, I was really liking how they kept, you kept it simple, and you're just doing your thing, and, the, and it worked so well, it was really great. And then I was also wondering if that then tempted you, as you guys are enjoying your collaboration and figuring out as you go, uh, thanks for the story about initially trying to do the overhead projector and burning your hand, you know? <laughs> but does it tempt you then to like collaborate with another filmmaker, you know, somebody who does have technical skills that you don't have, it, you know, if you wanted to, this was great live, but would you want to make a film out of, of something like this? Oh, you know? certainly, yeah. Um, and if anybody wants to turn Untersachen into a, uh, a limited series on Netflix, just give me a call. <laughs> um, put me in the writer's room, but uh, yeah, yeah, you gotta do the soundtrack. 
And um, just uh, please let me be your Yinglish consultant. Don't write Yinglish in a script without me. Um, yeah, definitely, certainly. I felt like I was kind of soundtracking your, making a soundtrack for your, what you were showing here. It, it felt like that to me too, and I love that, especially um, the clarinet with the guitar loops under the story about Poland, because I felt like it was referring to, yeah, wasn't that amazing? It was so beautiful. I felt like that was really a little referential to Klezmer without being too on the nose, you know? Yeah. Although if you just wanted to play Klezmer, that would have also been fine, but I, you know. Um, yeah, that really, that was really lovely. My, my high school clarinet. Uh -huh. <laughs> I'm, quite, I'm quite in the chops for that. <laughs> I was, I was also struck looking at this presentation how much um, you were reflecting on the cum lyrics about being submerged um, and how the first image in this presentation was about being submerged and then I was revisiting your work, Leela, from We All Wish for Deadly Force where one of the stories ends, there will always be parts of me that are submerged. Oh, yeah, I forgot I said that. Yep, yeah, it's like a, it's like a bookend to this piece. And that was, what, 2014? That was the first piece, 2015, that was the first piece I ever did in watercolor. That was like a career changer. And the first piece I ever, not the first piece I did about uh, trauma or something serious. I mean, I've been doing that since I was, you know, in my early 20s doing mini comics. I've been working with that material. But, but yeah, yeah. Um, there's a question over here, a couple actually. Um, I just had a question about, like, your work really does seem very perfectly matched. I mean, I, I don't like to use the word perfect because nothing's ever perfect, perfect but, um, but, and you were talking about sharing some common, common, do you guys have, are you from the same shtetl or something? Like, do you, <laughs> do you have common, background things? I, I, I think um, the whole Holocaust thing, like, I'm older than Leela, and so her case, it was her grandparents. In my case, it was, it was more like my parents um, that um, kind of went through that. My mom was born in Germany in 1926, and my dad was born in Lithuania in 1926. And um, they both moved to Israel when they were young and with their immediate families, you know, got out, but, but, but pretty much most of all the rest of the family was, was wiped out. And, um, and I kind of grew up with that shadow, you know, and it definitely comes into a lot of stuff I think about. And, um, you know, I have to say, you know, since, 2016, you know, it's really triggered a lot of kind of stuff for me, and I know for Leela too, and we've talked about it, and I think it's definitely present and in, in, it's coming out in, in my more recent work, you know. Yeah, definitely. It's, yeah, so very, I was sort of hyper aware of what's, what's going on. Yeah, so I think we work, but I don't think, we're trying to figure out, I don't, I don't think that our, our families come, we're not too far away, but. Um, Opposite sides of Poland. Okay. Yeah. Your, your, your family's from the this part of Poland German that was Germany and, and mine is from Galicia, so, like more, and Ukraine, like more, more Eastern. Uh, but in terms of sensibilities, yeah, and also I think, um, well, I don't know, I, I can only speak for myself here, but for me, my family history feels like an ethical responsibility to pay attention to what's happening now and, and call attention to it constantly in my own work. So when I'm writing, or drawing about family history or European history. I'm not only doing that, I'm also, I mean, it's sort of a well-known kind of statement to say when we're writing about history, we're also writing about our own current time period. Um, it, to me, it's like it, it provides an ethical framework for looking at, at how incredibly messed up things are now. And, and you brought up 2016, like, you know, it, it didn't make me insular and, and only thinking about my own family history and my own, my own story. It, it, it really opened my eyes more. But I could see, like, the, before that, the, the rhetoric around refugees. That. Yeah, no, that's, like, that one song that I played on You Awake, that was definitely written before that, about the, the whole, the trains of, the whole Syrian war, about trains of, the trains of 
people being put on trains and just, you know. Mm. And like, look what just happened a couple of days ago. Yeah, like, uh, yes, I know. And what, you know, yeah. so uh, the rhetoric around, around letting in refugees from that part of the world in 2015, I guess probably around the time you were writing that song, was exactly the same rhetoric against letting Jews in right. in the 1930s. There might be Nazis among them. That was, that was in the papers. <laughs> Um, I'm, thank you so much, guys. This was so beautiful. Um, I really loved explicitly naming like anti-fascist organizing in Poland, and I was hoping you might be willing to speak a little more to that and just like uh, the visual <laughs> aesthetic on your guitar as well. Tali was really well received. So if you could speak maybe to anti-fascism in your work and kind of explicitly using that term as well in this time and people's aversion to using it as well. <laughs> yeah, um, so I'm not a big fan of binaries, generally speaking, but there, there is a very strong binary with fascism. You're, you, you're anti or you're one of them. Um, and it's, what I see, I mean, you know, there, there isn't a middle ground with fascism. Like. I, there's a lot of ways I could answer that. I, I think I've, I've felt extremely, <laughs> I don't even know if frustrated is the right word for it, uh, by the way that it's discussed in the media as if there are a couple of sides. You know, we, we, we're, we're gonna talk to everybody um, since about 2015 or so. Um, when I think, for those of us who came through any kind of punk scene, especially, like, we learned you, you don't, let a skinhead into your bar, right? You don't let you don't let a skinhead hang out in your in your venue because the next night that person will come back with twenty of his friends and a like two by fours with nails in them and shit. So like that seemed like a really obvious thing. Like keep fascists out of the discourse, right? But you asked about Poland. It's hard not to talk about America. Um, so I'm not an expert on what is happening in Poland. I've, I've spent a little time there. I just got back from there a couple of weeks ago, actually. And to me, and again, I really want to put a lot of disclaimers here because I'm not an expert in Polish politics or history. This is just my personal connections with people there. Um, it just feels to me like the, the act of being honest about history is an anti-fascist act in itself. If you, if you are trying to dispel the effects of gaslighting, that's an anti-fascist act. And yeah, I don't know how, how much more I should go on about that. I feel like I might just start ranting. <laughs> Big deal to me, very important. Thank you. Hi, I'm Linda Bernard. I'm the um, special guest coordinator for all of this. Hi, you guys. <laughs> um, this came, uh, th the way this all came about, actually, um, we have my sister Diane to thank, who is back over here, um, if you want to raise your hand for uh, Yahoo. Um, <laughs> um, I've been fortunate enough from, Diane and Talia have been friends since high school. So I've been list I remember being the middle school or junior well we called it junior high then, and you know the kid's sister and Talia would always let me come into the room while they were playing Bob Dylan and Patti Smith on the guitar, and um, just very you know fond memories. And when all of this came out and I have um, Unterzaken and I you know I'm you know, familiar with some of Leela's work, and uh, so this just came together really beautifully, and I want to thank both of you so much, because I know it took a lot of work, this, you know, figuring out what is it we're going to do, yada, yada, and, um, and getting you here, and the whole thing, so um, I didn't want it to go past without thanking you, and um, beautiful work, thanks. Yeah. Well, thank you for bringing us, thank you for asking us to do this. Another question? There's, oh, yeah. There's someone down there. I can't tell if you're waving. Or... <laughs> um, the things that you guys both deal with are very heavy and obviously like very personal, but also pertain to the world at large right now so much so that I can imagine that 
you're often overwhelmed by feelings. How do you guys process it or like how do you handle your own like wellness and mental health? Because you know, if this is like it's such a heavy topic, even though it's really beautiful, it doesn't make it any less you know, like emotional for you. Do you guys have ways to deal with it to, you know, like a release is, you know, like runners run to like process emotions. Do you guys have like a key thing that you normally do to sort of help yourselves through it or once something's done and, you know, it's out that you can then reward yourself with? You want to go first or should I, okay. Uh, it really depends on what the material is I'm working with, but I need to move my body. I have to exercise, like I have to move. Um, so that's really important to my well-being. Um, when I was really deep in working on the book that I'm just wrapping up now, it's called Victory Parade, and it's sort of an accidental body horror story about the Second World War. I did not mean it to be a body horror story. But I found myself kind of, during the Trump years and also in the middle of the pandemic, meticulously painting mass graves and talking emaciated dead people in Busby Berkeley dance numbers and stuff. And it was really, there, there are Busby Berkeley dead people dancing Busby Berkeley numbers in my next book. Um, there was a point where it started to really take a toll on me, and I could feel like like something is not in balance here. Like I'm not I'm not doing my usual thing. Um, having a small child though really makes a difference. Like she would run into my studio at the end of the day, and I'd still be like hunched over painting some like pool of blood really meticulously, and or like a severed head singing a song, and she would come in and go, "What's that? What's happening there?" Why is that guy doing that? And then she'd be like, hey, let's go play with the cat. You know, so that, that's kind of an automatic uh, save. But moving my body, blasting very loud music, going to see live bands, which of course was not possible during the worst of the pandemic, but is now, luckily. Um, taking breaks, uh, and sometimes just carrying the weight. It does take a toll. There's, a, there's an album that had a really big influence on me at the, the transitional point in my career where I started working with color and really getting deeper into trauma storytelling. For lack of a better term, that's not all I do. But it's, uh, it's called Lament. It's by Einstein de Neubauten. And it's a, uh, it's a really incredible work of art. They were commissioned to create a performance to mark the centenary of World War I in this one particular Belgian town. And they created this amazing, immersive uh, work that is, it's a real triumph of research and archival work uh, and cross-disciplinary ways of using that. I read an interview after it came out where Blixa Bargeld was kind of asked a similar question and he said, well, it made me really difficult uh, for my family to be around. I would say that's definitely true of me at times. I think I've recovered from that somewhat because I'm basically done with this book. Uh, but yeah, sometimes it takes a toll. Um, you know, oftentimes I, I don't when I'm when I'm performing the songs. It's it's uh, enjoyable for me. Um, so uh, they, they deal with some dark topics, but I I I, I get pleasure from playing music, I get pleasure from singing, so, um, so it, it feels good to me. Um, and when I, when I write them, it, you know, sometimes when I'm writing dark stuff though, it, yeah, it does bum me out. And like, I've had my band, this band, Palm, that, that Lilo did the thing that's is going, going to be doing some touring because we're reissuing a bunch of older stuff and, and kind of relearning and re remembering the, the lyrics some of those songs, it's, it's, it's hard. Yeah, uh, dark. did they come from particular really experiences stuff. that? Just, it's just like, it's more like thinking about where I, I was at when I wrote them mm. is actually what kind of, what's hard about it, you yeah. know? Um, yeah. But, um, 
Yeah, I don't, I don't know. I don't know. I, I don't really have it. How to answer the answer that question? I mean, for me, art is something that make or playing music is something that makes me feel feel better. So that's that's what I do with with my feelings of of horror about what's you know <laughs> stuff going on. So I'm, yeah. I feel very grateful to have that. Yeah. yeah. Um, I'll also add that I've always been also a performer in some way or another in a few different mediums. And so having performance as some kind of counterpoint to sitting at a desk and painting all day, painting heavy stuff all day, has always been really helpful. That's kind of less true now, but it, it, that was also something that, that really helped. So like just having something else. But also I feel like when, when you were talking about getting pleasure out of, out of singing and performing the songs, it makes me wonder if um, the act of, of writing the song and, and having it, presenting it as a finished work is almost like, like a way of processing whatever you were writing about, and now it's, now it's done, it's framed, and it's processed, and here's the product of that process. Would that be accurate? Um, not, not so cleanly, but just like that that's a way of processing some of that stuff. Yeah, it definitely, it definitely is, yeah, a way, a way of processing it. Stuff, yeah, and um, you know, and it's something that you know I I don't really write overtly political songs, but but I feel like more and more lately I'm you know putting I express my opinion. I have some pretty strong opinions about stuff, and you know, and I, and I express it as a way way to express myself, and and maybe I don't know make someone feel better, someone who has those same feelings, be like, oh, someone else feels that way too, you know. You, I feel like your songs have, some of your records have definitely gotten more political in the last few years, and I definitely feel a sense of solidarity, but I'm also, like, thinking further back, Liars and Prayers, the first time I heard it was years after 9-11 and that whole time period, but it immediately felt to me like this is about the Bush years, like this is, was, am I right about that? It felt like it was about Finding out your country is torturing people, yeah. basically. Yeah. Yep. Yep. And that's a that's a Never really mind. searing work of art. That album. Thanks. So, so they asked me to uh, find a finite a finite point for this, and that sounds like a good place to end. Uh, thank you. Thank you both for doing this performance for us. Thank you so much, Josh, for moderating. That was great. And, uh, Honor. Thank thanks you. for coming, everybody, and, and for sticking it out for this Q&A. And thank you for having us, SPX. Thank you so much. Go SPX.